welcome to episode 165 of the Cricket Her Weekly. How are you, Sid? I'm good. Good. And we were going to record this at the cricket yesterday because we were actually at Beckenham to watch one of the first round matches in the Charlotte Edwards Cup. But it was quite windy, it was a bit chilly and we decided let's come home and just record it as our green screen back backdrop instead. Anyway, we've had three fixtures out of four in the opening round of the Charlotte Edwards Cup. Um, the fourth one is happening later on today. Um, so that's where we are at this point in time when we're recording this. And three quite interesting matches, Sid. Um, and we've been able to watch, uh, well, one of them live um, and the other two on the YouTube. So that's been good. Um, let's go through them um, in chronological order. So first up, we had Sunrisers v Sparks on Thursday at Chelmsford. Um, which that Sparks... was a long time ago, Ralph. I'm <laughs> quite not sure I can remember what happened in that one. So Sparks ended up winning um, fairly, well, I mean, they won by 23 runs, which in T20 cricket is a, a fair old whack, isn't it? Um, yeah, um, and it was um, 50s from Amy Jones and Cordelia Griffith, but um, Amy Jones was just a little bit ahead there. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, that... The... It was yet another match which the Sunrisers, you know, they, they weren't completely wiped off the face of the map. They, they came reasonably close. But the difference between the two teams was that Amy Jones made her 50 in 30-something balls uh, and Cordelia Griffiths, who played really well, um, made hers in 40-something balls. Um, you know, and, you know, Amy Jones, when she's on song, you know, is one of the most destructive batters in this format, you know, in the world. And so she came through and, yeah, that was where that was. That was. Um, you know, and I think, you know, overall, some other good performances from Sparks. I mean, Emma ended up taking four wickets, didn't she? And, you know, she's looking good. Um, one person whose performance I do want to raise is, is what, what's going on with Izzy Wongraff? Mm. Um, because, you know, I mean, Sparks are, Sparks are her home team. You know, she's, she's from Birmingham originally. You know, she's, she's got, uh, you know, the people that have known her a long time. And these people know her better, her cricket better than anyone else in the world. And they're 220 for They're batting her at nine. Um, you know, and she, you know, made what something, something like five runs or seven balls. Um, not, you know, nothing to shout about. Um, she's bowling second change. Um, she bowled one over, which conceded 12 runs. It contained three full tosses. Um, and it, she's just not looking, not looking like a world beater at all at the moment. You know, what's going on, Raf? Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Obviously, she was left out of England's World Cup squad. And so um, I think that she ended up spending most of the winter at home um, after that Caribbean tour kind of training with the region. Um, obviously, we don't have any particular insight into what's going on. It'll be interesting to see whether she makes the Ashes squad, um, which I guess they're going to have to announce quite soon because the Ashes are starting quite soon. <laughs> um, and Five weeks I, and counting. Yeah, it, it is one of those things. I don't know if we've said this before, but if you were, if you um, had no knowledge of these players and you watched the Central Sparks game and somebody said to you, one of these players has been playing for England and one, um, one of these bowlers has been, has been kind of um, tipped as England's next fast bowler who's going to open the bowling for the next generation to come and you looked you would go oh yeah Emma look yeah yeah she looks really good um and that must be um it's an interesting one because obviously Emma that's kind of had some has been called up to the England squad a couple of times um and has just through kind of some misfortune because of um of uh, getting over COVID and things like that has not quite managed to force her way into the actual 11 whereas Wong has um, but yeah, I mean, if, if I was Arla and I was outperforming Wong basically every time we played a match, then I'd be a bit like, hello, England. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> My name's Emily Arla. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's a tricky one. And I think um, obviously Izzy Wong's been in the news recently with the whole, um, you know, it's perhaps slightly unwise comments, shall we say, ahead of the um, head of the Women's Ashes series, uh, making some kind of comment about it seemed to be implying that Australia's days of dominance are over and um, it's going to hand over to a, a new generation soon or so, something of that ilk anyway. And it's obviously been picked up by the Australian media and they're running with it because that's what they do. Um, and I just think for somebody who hasn't kind of nailed down their own place in the even in the squad, let alone the starting eleven, that was perhaps a slightly unwise thing to do. Yeah, you, you'd be forgiven if several of the Australians are like, come back to us when you've won the last four World Cups. Well, yeah, yeah. And and to some extent, maybe putting a target on your own back if you do yeah. get selected. So, yeah, not not sure about that. Um, 
if we're thinking about other kind of more positive spark stories, um, I guess it's nice to see Davina Perrin opening the batting for them, isn't it, in T20 cricket? Yeah, I mean, this is very much one for the future, I think. I, I think that if you, you, know, you said, well, we, we, we absolutely want the best team, you know, for here and now, you know, you, then you might not make that decision um, because she's still clearly not the finished article. Um, but, you know, she's, she's 16. Uh, yeah, you know, 16, she's still got yeah. an, another under-19 World Cup yeah. to come, let alone, you know, an entire career after that. So giving her that experience up front is a, a real positive thing and a real sign that, that Sparks are trying their best under Laura McLeod to, to kind of fulfil the, the promise of the regions, not just to you know, win regional cricket matches, but to kind of develop players for the future and build you know, the next generation for England. So yeah, I think that's fantastic. I think Sparks do that really well, actually, um, out of all of the teams, um, actually giving kind of youngsters those genuine proper opportunities, um, while also they do, they do win their fair share of games. You know, they were in the final of the, um, the Lottie Cup last year, weren't they? Yeah, you wouldn't so, bet against them this time. I mean, yeah. we, we do understand that the England players are probably going to be available for the, the latter stages of this tournament okay. um, you know they, they might withdraw some players you know mm -hmm. that they're particularly concerned about resting as one name that we might come to in a minute um, but you know if they have Amy Jones throughout the tournament and going into the final who, who would bet against them okay well um, let's move on then and talk about the second game this was the one on Friday night um, Diamonds v The Storm um, and Diamonds wow <laughs> they smashed that previous record score admittedly we're only in the third year of the Charlotte Edwards Cup um, but they smashed it previously it was 186 they made 218 but they only ended up winning by um, 32 runs which as we've just said in T20 cricket is quite a lot but when you're chasing 218 and you manage to put 186 on the board that's pretty good going from the Western Storm and I think really shows how far we've come um, in quite a short space of time in domestic cricket because a few years Very ago so. if I'd said to you a team's going to make 186 in T20 cricket chasing you would have laughed me out of the kitchen yeah, well, I mean, 186 was the kind of total that people often made in 50 over yeah, matches in the, days, exactly. in the days of the old exactly. county championship, wasn't it, Raph? And there's been some talk about the boundary size, Sid, hasn't there? That was one of the sort of talking points. There, there has been a bit, yes. Um, and, you know, well, I think there's, there's a few things going on. I mean, the boundaries haven't been huge. The boundaries at um, Beckenham yesterday, the the straight boundaries were pretty damn short. Yeah. The, the, the square boundaries were big, the straight ones were very short. So there were, there were sixes going straight back over the bowler's head that were making it quite easily. Um, and in fact, one that hit the, hit the sight screen that was back on the, the actual men's boundary that they used for the men's yeah. first class match at Beckenham, which was like way back. That was nasty. Anyway, um, so, um, it, and it's going to be something that people are going to keep raising. It was raised a lot in the WPL. What I think about, we must remember about Headingley is it's really easy for it to look like they've brought the boundaries in mm -hmm. a lot because Headingley is a huge ground. Headingley is much wider than Lords, for example. Um, so, you know, and they, they used a strip that was over to one side of the square. So there was a big space between the rope and the, the fence on, the, on one side. Um, and that makes, that always gives you kind of the, the it's almost an optical illusion. It gives you the impression that the boundaries are shorter than they are. Um, I tried my best to measure them via the highly scientific method of um, taking a screenshot from YouTube and measuring the number of pixels. Well, it was the and best I, that we had, so well I, done. <laughs> I reckon they were regulation. Um, okay. So, you know, and we definitely saw in the WPL that they admitted the boundaries were less than the regulation, but I reckon these yeah. were regulation, but they weren't long. So, okay. know. Um, but, but, you know, the boundaries are the same for both teams and yeah. both teams did take advantage of it. Yeah, and, they did. You know, Absolutely. It, did, it did provide an enjoyable game and, you know, we, we definitely enjoyed Lauren Winfield Hills not, didn't we? Yeah, it um, was a shame that she fell too, too much short of 100, but <laughs> yeah, ultimately I mean, she'll it was be a sort of kicking innings. herself. But... And Sid, I've got a question for you. At what point does, because we've just You've just talked about Amy Jones being one of the best batters um, in the in the country, but at what point does Lauren Winfield Hill's excellent form with the bat in domestic cricket um, allow her to edge out um, as as England's current reserve keeper? Allow her to edge out England's current main keeper, Amy Jones, from the, yeah, that's from the a really starting eleven point. because obviously really Amy question. Jones is a better keeper than Lauren Winfield. Yeah, no, I don't no think, doubt. You know, it, <laughs> Lauren Winfield's own grandmother is not is not going to claim that Lauren but, Winfield is but at, but, Lauren Winfield here is a better keeper. But at what against. point but, does does it tip the balance yeah. where you go? Actually, we could probably do with a few more runs in the Ashes. 
Yeah, and the, you know we've all seen it so many times. Lamy Jones that she looks absolutely fantastic at this at this low at the low at, in the domestic games, mm -hmm. and even in, in international games, it's, it's this thing of like you know if she thinks nobody's watching, if it's a small crowd and whatever, but she does seem to let the pressure get to her. And when the pressure's on and the pressure will be on in the Ashes, that's when you know she'll turn in a run of low scores, and then she'll come into the she'll probably come she'll turn in a run of low scores, and then she'll come into the next series, and then she'll hit a huge score off no balls at all, and everyone will be like, oh, everything's fine again. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's a tough one. But, you know, I mean, Lauren Winfield Hill has also had her fair share of chances. But at the moment, you know, she's definitely giving Amy Jones a run for her money. I think that Amy Jones is still, you know, the person in possession. And, you know, this yeah. if, if Amy Jones can, you know, make a score at the beginning of the Ashes series. But you have to say, if, you know, if she doesn't make a score in the first three or four games, they could well be going, well, OK, we're going to, you know, bring Lauren Winfield in for the, for the later games in the Ashes series. Mm -hmm. OK, it's an interesting one. Now, talking of keeping, you were pleased because Bess Heath had the gloves, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, so, so, you know, and I've got no inside information here, but I do wonder if this was actually part of the deal because I talked at the beginning of the season about how disappointing it was that she wasn't keeping in the 50 over competition in the RHF um, because that's clearly, you know, she's clearly a potential future England wicketkeeper batter. Um, so I wonder if part of the deal with her was that they told her that she would be keeping in this tournament because obviously Lauren Winfield Hill playing, um, Bess Heath uh, keeping, um, and, you know, She's again. She's she is not a better keeper than Lauren Winfield Hill. Nobody thinks that. Um, but she needs to build up that experience in order to become a better keeper. Mm -hmm. And by playing these games, you know that's that's a big positive because she'll get more and more experience, and it, she will build on that, and she will become a much better keeper. So you know she'll become the keeper that England need her to be in five years' time when she'll be you know walking out with the gloves for England. Absolutely. Now, one slightly mysterious thing about the Diamonds v Storm game was that um, Heather Knight was named in the squad, but wasn't named in the eleven. Um, now, from from YouTube, I don't believe that we could see whether or not she was actually at the ground, even. Um, although it would be odd to name somebody in the squad and then them not to travel with the team. Um, so I suppose we have to assume that she was there. Um, and of course, you're not going to not play Heather Knight if she's fit and available. So it's all a bit weird because yeah. why was she named in the squad if she wasn't either fit or available? Is there some, has she got some kind of niggle? She has, she did play one fixture for them in the Rachel Hayhurst Lint Trophy. It was curtailed by rain. Um, so I think she ended up, you know, on, you know, facing like one over and she scored five or something um, because she didn't have the opportunity to go on and, and develop that. But it's just a little bit of a concern, isn't it? Yeah, we've if, they, got an if they're worried series, about her starting. playing a domestic T20, she's supposed to be playing a five day test in, you know, five yeah, weeks time. Exactly. That's so that is got to be a concern. Well, definitely. Yeah. And there's, it's all kind of. There were definitely a few people on Twitter asking about it, and the information is not forthcoming from any quarter. Yeah, um, we don't have so any more information than you do, basically. I, I suppose that, that the ECB, if there is an issue, might be trying to keep it on the down low ahead of the Ashes, um, because they would know that the you know without Heather Knight, the Australians would be absolutely cock a hoop, wouldn't they? To, if if we're going into an Ashes series, if England are going into an Ashes series with with no captain, and that is again, we're coming back to it. That is again the big concern if England are going into this with no captain because we saw what happened last summer when Heather Knight was sitting on the sidelines um, forced out through injury and if that happens against Australia then all of this talk of it's going to be a really competitive series is I'm just a bit concerned Sid yeah. I don't want it to be another one-sided ashes Okay, anyway, <laughs> let's cross that bridge. You might want to spend the next, the next two months hiding in a cupboard yeah. in that case, right? <laughs> let's cross that bridge when we come to it, Sid. Okay, um, now let's talk about the Stars v Blaze game that we were lucky enough to watch in person um, live at Beckenham yesterday. So if you look at the scorecard, um, Blaze won by five wickets. Um, Stars had hit 160 and Blaze managed to chase it down. They only managed it in the last over, though. Yeah, but it was actually a, a much less close game than than it looks from that. I think it was, okay. a, um, you know, Blaze. The last couple of overs, Blaze knew they had it by that point. Um, you know, it, it was a good total by Stars in the end. It was a game that kind of swung swung around. It did didn't it? swing around, yeah. Um, swung around more than the ball did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was our first look at the Blaze, Sid, because obviously they're the new kids on the block, aren't they, this season? I mean, obviously we're familiar with a lot of the players, but now they're now wearing a different kit that looks 
identical to Viper's Very kit. Orange. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, and you'd done some analysis previously from their performances in the Rachel Hayes. Yeah, because of course they're, they're, they are top of the table in the RHF. They are. So, you know, yeah, they've, they've had a, a, good, a good start. They're the only side, the only side they're unbeaten, I think. I think so, um, yeah. And, you know, well, they, they remain because they, um, they beat the stars. won yesterday. Yeah. Um, but their success in the RHF has been very, very much down to their bowling. If you look at their bowling metrics, they're, they're really good. They're, they're way out in front. The, the, the top, like, four bowlers across all the teams are all... Blaze bowlers, right, okay. um, uh, and the batting has really let them down. And you, actually, you can see that in some of the results if you read the match reports, because there are two instances in those RHF games where the bowlers put, gave the batters, batters a total gimme. Like yeah. we've bowled them out for for not very much at all. Go and do your thing, and they nearly stuffed it up not yeah. once but twice. Yeah. So the batting has been flaky, and the batting almost looked flaky again yesterday, didn't it? So Tammy Beaumont, Tammy Beaumont looked looked really good. She looked like a pro proper T Twenty player. Um, Opening yeah, yeah, so you know, <clears throat> she looked she looked in good nick, um, and that Siva, that Siva was playing. Um, she, she also was making her a bit. debut for the Blaze, so she that was, was quite exciting. So she, she bowled a bit. Um, she had a bit of strapping on her right arm, but it didn't seem to be affecting her. And she did. I think she bowled three overs, did she? I don't think um, it was, she bowled all four, but you know, she was. Like that. It, she I was. Mean, her, yeah, she wasn't. It wasn't her best day with the ball. No, but, but she was um, looking fine for someone that hasn't played for. Yeah. You know, what six weeks or something okay so she then came out and smashed 19 runs at number yep. three so that was fun so nat siva and tammy Beaumont, kind of between them gave them a little bit of a platform yeah and then they had a collapse and then we thought it's happening again well they were i've got it written down here they were 91 for five um in something like the 12th over now in the olden days 91 for five that's it you're done. You're done and dusted. Um, and actually, I remember a few years ago on, on um, Women's County Cricket Day um, at Guildford, we were commentating with Dan Norcross on Lancashire v Surrey, and Surrey were chasing a, not a huge total. This was a 50 over game, um, and they were like two or three wickets down. And I think Dan Norcross was like, "Oh, they've got this in the bag. It'll be really easy." And we both said, "If if Surrey lose a couple of wickets here, then they're going to be in trouble because if you get five or six down." And in a women's county cricket match, then that is often the end. Um, not necessarily that you get bowled out, but your numbers like, um, you know, six onwards don't have the power to hit it beyond the beyond the ring, beyond the infield. Um, so you won't get the runs. You won't actually be able to score at anything approaching the, the, yeah. the necessary rate. Um, and he was really surprised. Um, and then what happened? Well, sorry, lost a couple of wickets and they screwed up the run chase and they lost by like quite a small amount. It was a very exciting finish. So, um, And Dan Norcross was like, oh, yeah, oh, women's cricket, not the same as men's cricket. Well, now what we're seeing is very much the fruits of professionalism, isn't it? We're seeing, um, you know, Western Storm hitting 186 in a 20 over game, um, chasing 218. And we are seeing uh, a situation like yesterday where a team can be kind of 90 odd for five um, with a few overs to go and still an and awful amount of runs. And some serious because they needed eight yeah. and over at that Exactly, at that eight and over. And eight and over just would not be... What was you used to get maximum bonus points for in the county championship? Was it four forgetting, and over? Forget, uh, forgetting 200 and a 50 over match. Okay, so, yeah. so there you go. So that was. So that's about the rate. So we're, we're talking double. Um, that's how that's how much better it's got. Anyway, it was all about Georgie Boyce, wasn't it, from that Yeah, point? it was. And, you know, well, we talk a lot about well, when players move from you know one place to another, they, they're at their home county or, or club and then they move somewhere else and the advantages of doing that. But sometimes that doesn't work out. And Georgie Boyce uh, moved over to the Thunder for a while. Uh, she didn't have a great time there um, by all accounts. She's now come back to her, her home in Nottinghamshire uh, and she's at the blaze and you know, probably the, the best she's ever played and she should feel incredibly positive about that I mean was it was it pretty was it Sarah Taylor-esque flowing drives and silky swooshes no no it wasn't but you know it, it really did the job for them and she, you know she hit a lot of runs quickly when there was real pressure on because that was I mean that's the key to that situation you know anyone can smash it like that in the nets but she was being asked to do it you know mm. when the game was on the line and she came through for them so you know fantastic and you know another player that, that looks like you know if she's found her home she can be a fantastic re regional cricketer Pro probably not someone that's ever going to play for England if we're really honest but, you know, if you can have a fantastic career as a regional cricketer, that shouldn't be important. You should be able to have a good career as a regional cricketer and, you know, go her. Great. Okay. 
So that was a good one to be at, Sid, and we're looking forward to the rest of the Lottie Cup as it unfolds um, in quite a condensed period over the next few weeks because they want to get it all out of the way before the Ashes. So as you say, the England players can potentially play um, in all of the games. Maybe. We don't know. Well, it, we'll have to see. Hopefully. <laughs> Um, but the, but we understand that um, that the Ashes squad won't be convening until after the final. So they could, in theory, yeah. so it depends on workload, etc. Okay, another big announcement this week, Sid, just quickly. Um, ICC have announced some new playing conditions. Um, and there's and one in particular that you have obviously got a bit of a bee in your bonnet about. Um, there's a, one about um, the umpires no longer being required to give a soft signal when referring decisions to the TV umpire, which is kind of interesting. Um, I guess it kind of... Have you, have you talked about your theories about umpiring on air yet? About yeah, how um, umpires are going to gradually become redundant? Yeah, and this I is think kind of a step ultimate, in that direction, the, isn't the, it? The on-field umpires are going to become redundant. It's going to be taken over. Up, you know, in the shorter term, by by TV umpires doing more and more work, and in the longer term, you know, we'll we'll have AI that does this job well, for them, and the an umpires' role theory. on the field will become largely okay. ceremonial. I don't necessarily I agree with it, but I think this is basically what we're saying is that well, what the ICC is saying is we don't want the umpires to look stupid by giving a soft signal and then having to overturn it. Once we've actually yeah. used the technology, let's go straight to the technology. So to some extent, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but the other one is about making helmets mandatory, but only in certain situations. So what they're calling high risk positions. So if you're a batter facing a fast bowler, if you're a keeper standing up, or if you're a close fielder, then the, um, sort of in front of the bat, not if you're a slip fielder, you would have to wear a helmet. Um, so it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think it's a positive step in the right direction. I still think it doesn't okay. go far enough. I think that we should be requiring batters in particular to wear helmets at all times. I can see why they didn't go there because there are clearly powerful people within the men's game that don't want that. Plenty of the top male players don't like to wear helmets mm -hmm. against the against slow bowling, well they probably don't like to wear them against fast bowling either if they could, but they do so. Um, and you know, but I think that what we should be looking to do, apart if, if nothing else, is level the playing field. Because some countries, in particular England, um, but I believe also the case in Australia, um, the professional players are required to wear helmets as a yeah. kind of condition of their contracts, yeah. which is mandated not just by you know people like the ECB being concerned for their welfare, but also by things like you know being concerned for their bank balance and what happens if they get sued. We've got a case going through the courts at the moment in this country where the Rugby Football League, uh, which is the equivalent of the NRL if you're Australian, are being sued by ex-players because of head injuries sustained during their careers. The ECB don't want that, so they're saying, you know, you know, you need to wear a helmet at all times when batting. So, I mean, the England players are required to wear a helmet at all times when batting, whereas players in other countries aren't. And that's fundamentally a little bit unfair, and I think we should level the playing field. But it's a step in the right direction. It's shown where the ICC are going, and I think it's pretty clear that in five years' time they're going to extend the rule and go, no, you wear it all the time uh, when, when you're batting. I think that will happen. It's just a matter of time. Well, if nothing else, it's a practical question. If you're only required to wear a helmet when you're facing up to fast bowlers, first of all, who makes that yeah, distinction? Yeah, what is a fast bowler? Um, so what's the definition? And secondly, how, quite much... Insulting to the bowler. <laughs> how much yeah. faffing around between overs um, if it's... If you're switching between quick bowling at one end and spin oh, at the other. in the men's game all the time. They don't, they don't have a problem with over rates in the men's game, do no, they? No, no problem no, at all. not that I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you just have to keep... You keep your 12th man or 12th person busy <laughs> by their run, they run on and off the field every over to take well, the helmet on and off. Get them delivered by a little sponsored drone. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? I can actually see that happening in the IPL, can't you? That would be, awesome. that would be another money-making scheme that would go down really well. I'm copywriting that. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's wrap up there. Thanks so much as ever for tuning in and we'll see you in a week's time. Bye. Bye.